So just to let you know, so before, I also didn't really know what Cinco de Mayo was. So, uh, Cinco de Mayo, as we all know, is celebrated on May 5th. And just, just like it was said before, it was a Mexican victory over the Second French Empire in the Battle of Puebla in 1862. You may wonder where I got this from. By General Ignacio. And what else? See, the battle, uh, for us, as we must listen to the that Secret of Mayo, the first time it was ever celebrated in the U.S. was actually in 1862 in California, Colombia. It wasn't until the 1980s that it became really popular in the U.S. And it really became a time to celebrate just Latin American culture. And as was said before, a lot of us confuse Cinco de Mayo with Independence Day, <laughs> which is on September 16th. <laughs> right. 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 But of course, when Cinco de Mayo happened, that battle, it was uh, for that battle was really important. Why? Because I love what was shared before. It was a it was a story of an underdog story. It was a battle led by students, by young people who really had to make a decision. And the decision was to fight. Amen. You know, we live in a time where you think you don't have to make that decision anymore. No, you always have to fight. Life is a battle. And one of Satan's greatest scheme is that it's not. You ever wonder why you're called to put on the full armor of God instead of putting on the full pajamas of God? Because it's a battle. It's a battle. I remember my first time boxing. I was boxing wearing glasses, and then the guy hit me. I'm like, hey, bro, I'm wearing glasses. <laughs> he did not care. He's like, why are you wearing glasses? You're in the ring. Come on, bro. And that's how some of us can be in our walk with God. You know, why am I struggling? And you're shocked that Satan punches you. And you're shocked that you're struggling. All right. You just started the battle. Come on, bro. Let's go to Genesis 22. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, and we'll pick it up in verse 1. And it says this, Sometime later God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, Here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early next morning Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told them about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I go, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire, uh, the fire in the night. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, on the top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham! Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Here we see Abraham. And it said that sometime later, God tested him. God tested him. You know, it's interesting where everyone wants to have a great testimony. But no one wants to go through a great test. Most of us are actually stopping our testimony. 
that God calls him, and what does he say to him? I want you to go and sacrifice Isaac, the one you love. Wow. His only son, who the promise was about to come true. And so he takes him, and he says, early in the morning, what does this teach us? Mo, uh, Abraham did not hesitate in his obedience. Early in the morning. He didn't prolong this. He didn't sleep in it because it was a hard test. He obeyed early in the morning. And as he goes there, he's with his son. And they're getting closer and closer to where they need to be. And he tells his servant, I need you to wait here. And honestly, what I believe is the reason why Abraham told his servant to wait, because he wasn't spiritual enough to be a part of what's going to happen next. Wow. That's good. Wow. It's like, I'm going to have you wait because you're probably going to try to stop me. Wow. So I need you to stay. You're going to learn to understand. Some of you guys aren't spiritual enough. Do you ever right. wonder why people don't want, like talking to you about contribution? You're not spiritual enough to have a, a conversation about contribution. That's good. You're not spiritual enough to have a conversation. So get spiritual. And so you stop missing out on all those conversations. Abraham knew. So he told me, I need you to stay back. Because what I'm going to do takes a lot of spirituality. Yeah. And I don't want to be tempted by someone to stop me. Wow. Then he goes there and he prepares for his son. And of course, his son is not dumb. He's seen sacrifices before. It's like, where is the lamb? And his son, and his dad replies, God will provide. God will provide. For some of us, that's not enough. We live in a time where everyone just wants the details. What's the plan? What's the details? Sometimes God telling you it's God will provide, that's enough. Yeah. And then he goes and he reaches for his knife and he says he's about to slay his son. And then he says, stop, Abraham. Now I know that you fear God. You know, for us today, we got to learn to understand that the Battle of Puebla for Cinco de Mayo was just that. It was a battle. Wow. It was a moment in time. Wow. See, in the religious world, it's all about moments. Mm. Remember that one time I shared my faith? Wow. <laughs> Remember that one time I gave to God? Wow. You remember that one time I denied myself? <laughs> See, being a disciple is not about moments. It is about life. The title lesson today is A Life of Victory. A Life of Victory. You know, for most of us, we must understand you're not who you think you are. You are who you decided to be. Wow. You're an accumulation of all the decisions you've ever made. You decide who you want to be. Living a life of victory is a decision that you make every single day. And you have to make it. You know, growing up, my dad told me two things. Son, don't be afraid of hard work. And don't be afraid of success. Mm. Why? Because success requires hard work. Wow. And then hard work will lead you to success. And now you have to work harder. All right. You know, a life full of victory is really a life of surrender to God. Yeah. You know, are you surrendered to victory? Mm. I love my wife's communion. I did not help her, by the way. That was totally the spirit of God. She came up to me and told me, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm like, wow, that is so good. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know? And what does that mean? 
is you got to be surrendered for victory. Yeah. Every single one of us knows exactly what we have to do. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know what you have to do to make your life better. Yeah. For Christ. And honestly, for yourself. But the question is, are you doing it? Mm. Are you doing it? See, the number one problem in your life is you. But you're also the number one solution. Amen? Live the life that you want to be. You know, for us, I'm going to talk about three battles that we need to constantly be victorious for. Let's go to the first one. Let's go to First Samuel 17. I was inspired by Courtney. She's like, maybe you should preach about this. I'm like, let's do it. First <laughs> Samuel 17 in verse 20. And this is the story of David and Goliath. As most of us know it. First Samuel 17, and let's pick it up in verse 20. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position. Shouting the war cry, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from God, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Here we see David, and it says that he wakes up early in the morning. See, he's fired up to serve. See, when you're cranking, you don't want things to stop. And you wake up early in the morning. All right. Yeah. He was fired up. He woke up early in the morning. And it said that he had gone to bring uh, cheese to the army as directed by Jesse. David was the cheese boy. <laughs> he was the cheese boy. And this is actually a very sad moment in the Bible. Why is that? Because if you read the chapter before, Samuel had come to anoint David. Right. And in front of his father, he told him, this is the king. So his own father didn't believe in his son. Uh, Not because he didn't believe in his son, because he didn't believe in God. Wow. That's good. And it said that Jesse directed him. He said, Son, you're the cheese boy. I don't care what anybody else says. Wow. we got to learn to understand as disciples, God can work around you, but he chooses to work through you. God can work around you, but he chooses to work through you. You know, for some of us, we don't believe the people that God puts in our lives. We don't. Constantly doubting, can I really do this? Are you sure? You read it in your quiet times, and then another disciple filled with the Holy Spirit comes and tells you the exact same thing. You know how hard that is to happen? You know? Think about it. We see it every Sunday. People try to do the welcome together. Never works. But we try every Sunday. Every, we give all our hearts. See ya. <laughs> Every Sunday. <laughs> we do it in Kansas City as well, too, so it's not like it's not. You know how hard it is? Come on, bro. To be unified? <laughs> Every Sunday. <clears throat> See, David was called. And he went on the battlefield and he saw the champion Goliath. What does the word champion mean in the Hebrew? He says, it says, a man. A servant or a person that has defeated and surpassed all rivals. He saw a champion. He saw Goliath. What was Goliath? He was just a man. Wow. He was a man. Come on. You know, I honestly believe 
one of the biggest sins of our world, of our generation today, is that people aren't men. Come on, just not a man. Even before David died, he told his son Solomon, you can read it in the first chronicle, he said, act like a man. That was his charge to his son. He said, be a man, Solomon. Just be a man. It takes a man to be a man of God. That's why we don't baptize kids. We baptize men. And he comes here and he sees this, this, this champion. And then, and then what does he hear? He hears, whoever kills this champion will get a lot of money, will get my daughter, and doesn't have to pay taxes. <laughs> but you got to learn from this situation. What was Saul doing? He was copping out. He was trying to get bailed out of God's challenge for him. This story should have never been about David. It should have been about Saul. How he conquered Goliath. Point number one is fight your own battles. You gotta fight your own battles. You know, are you fighting your own battles? Saul was too fired up to have someone else fight his battles. You know, for some disciples, we come into the kingdom and what happens? We get weaker. We get entitled. And we expect people to fight our battles for us. This is your race. This is your walk with God. Every single disciple is willing and so fired up to help you. Right. But at the end of the day, this is your race. Are you fighting your battles? The Goliaths in your own personal life. You know, for many of us, we don't want to. We really don't. Let's go to Galatians 6, 7 to 9. To understand this a little bit more. Galatians 6, 7 to 9. Galatians 6, 7 to 9. And it says this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You're going to reap what you sow. God loves you for who you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. He does. The kingdom of God is the only place where you really have to deal with it. We're not here to encourage you to brush all your sin under the rug. We're not here to call you to hide your sin in a closet. So your living room looks nice. You're called here to repent and face your vows. You will reap what you sow. Yeah. You know, for us disciples, for some of us, what do we want? We don't want to be trained by God. <laughs> you know, you're going through some things and you're like, God, take this away from me. You're praying to God to literally take away your training. God, make this stop. That sounds like someone who doesn't want to walk. Instead of asking why, ask yourself, God, what are you trying to teach me? How do you want me to grow? What do you want me to learn? How do you want me to fight? You know, we're going to fight our own battles, and you're going to reap what you sow. One of the biggest sins that we do as disciples is we, we compare each other's races. And what do we say? That's good. They have it easier. Look at their life. If I had that Bible talk, I would pray too. 
<laughs> oh, you wouldn't, because you'd be in it. <laughs> no. Yes, we have to understand that. And we just compare ourselves. Yep. And it stops you from growth. You know, there's a fine line between a visionary and a delusionary. And a, vision, a visionary has a plan. You know? A visionary takes steps. A visionary is ready to pay the price. You can live a life of victory. You can. But you have to make a decision every day. And for us, all of us have been given the Holy Spirit to overcome. All right. This life is impossible without the Holy Spirit. But you have it. So it's very possible. So I want to challenge you to fight your own battles. Let's go to our second point. You guys with me? Let's go to John 15. John 15, verse 1. And it says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the, wor the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like the branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Point number two is fight to be pruned. Fight. See, the Bible starts here, and if you know some of your Bibles are red letters, so Jesus is talking, you know, directly. And he says to them, I am the true vine. You know, and my father cuts up every branch that does not bear fruit. He said, But I am going to prune you so you can be more fruitful. Why don't we like to be pruned? Because it doesn't always look good. See, when you're pruned by God, or refined, or trained, they all mean the same thing, you're going to have two reactions. Either it's going to distract you or attract you to God. <laughs> Does, do your lessons attract you to God? Or do they distract you? Mm. You know, for some of us, when we're going, through, when God's teaching us and refining us, we get distracted. We get distracted by the pain. We get distracted by the cost. We get distracted by the process. Instead of getting attracted to God, who is doing this so you can be more fruitful. More. You know, it's so awesome to see uh, Thomas and Ingrid of the Bozeman Mission Team. <laughs> it's incredible to see that I came out of Seattle. <clears throat> you know, Thomas called me. He's like, hey, bro. I need some advice. I'm like, sure, what is it? How do I crank this inaugural? So I told Thomas, bro, I think you should call Jeremiah, because I tempted him. So. <laughs> I said, uh, uh, maybe you should call me after the inaugural. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, he got 200, bro. I don't know if you remember what happened, but <laughs> he didn't go stop for us. <laughs> Bless Thomas's heart. <laughs> oh, Lord. See, you cannot be pruned if you do not take responsibility. You can't. You can. You know, me and my wife, Boise was incredible. Boise was awesome. I loved it. When we went to Kansas City, we took a hard reset. We took a hard reset. All right. 
What can I do better? Boom. What do I need to repent of? Boom. What needs to be different? Boom. It was our second chance again. Boom. This is our second mission to you planting. Now what am I going to do different? Boom. See, in order for you to properly be pruned, you must take responsibility for where you're really at. Where you're really at. And I was watching these, these videos on entrepreneurs. And one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make is they think they have something that the competition doesn't. They think, what I have is so awesome. And the guy said, honestly, it's probably not. Otherwise, you would have all that money. It's probably not. And even if it is the competition, they're going to imitate you and then make it better. Right. Yeah. And you have a window. And they're going to try to make sure they shut you down in that window. Yeah. You know, for us as disciples, God wants to prune you. Yeah. But you got to take a hard look at yourself. Yeah. Without getting discouraged. Yeah. Without getting discouraged. It's okay to need help. It's okay to want to get better. It's okay. You know, for me, when I take a hard look at myself, I give myself a time limit. Why? Because if I do it tomorrow, it actually works. I get discouraged. <laughs> you know, I'll just do this for an hour and a half. You know what I mean? Maybe an hour and a half because I'm too good at looking at that, you know? You guys got to learn to really just take a healthy look at yourself. Yeah. If it's good for you. God wants to make you more fruitful. He wants to. But how do you know if you're going through the pruning process spiritually? Because you'll become more fruitful. You know, I, I love what I want to share. I mean, what do you want to say at the end of your life? I wish I had more money. Or I wish there was more people with me in heaven. You know, there are very few things you get to bring to heaven. And one of them is each other. See, for us here is, when you get refined by God, it should make you more fruitful. Mm. Well, why don't we? Because we don't, we don't take a, a real look at ourselves. Yeah. We think we're humble. Yeah. What do we do? We go up to our Bible talk leaders, you know, fired up. <laughs> How many studies do we have today? <clears throat> You know, we go up to our leaders like, how many studies do you need me in? Bro, I need you in zero. Go share your faith. Of course. We want everything just handed to us. Of course. We ask ourselves like, why aren't we growing? Because you're talking to me, bro. Go talk to the lost. That's why we're not growing. Go share your faith, bro. It's pretty simple. You know what to do. Building God's kingdom builds you. I don't share my faith for them. I share my faith for me. The Bible says a kernel of wheat must die to bear fruit. So when I study the Bible of people, I, I ask myself, man, what do I need to die in so this person can live? What does God want to change in me that I need to change? You know, for a lot of my discipleship life, most of the people I study the Bible with were pretty similar. Why? Because I didn't want to change in that area. And what were they? It was the same story. Do you want to be my friend? And I was like, no. Be God's friend. <laughs> yeah. I struggle yeah. with building relationships. Come on. You know, in the world, I love being shallow. Shallow was my favorite. Yeah. I loved it. You don't have to invest very high. You don't emotionally get damaged. It's really easy, actually, to live a shallow life. It's pretty yeah. easy. And you can pretend you have friends, you know what I mean? Yeah, we're friends, you know. Like on Facebook and Instagram, we're like totally like this. Come on. But those are the people that God constantly sent in my life. And they're still here. I'm discipling people, and one of them asks me, hey, bro, can I come to hang out? I love God, I love God. Yes. <laughs> I 
love soccer. I don't. <laughs> you know, I never knew that. I just don't. You know, but I love God. <laughs> so let's go play some soccer, bro. Can, can I be the goalie? Just make sure they don't come. <laughs> but you gotta fight to be proved. You know, for everybody, I want to challenge you. I want you to change your mind and have a healthy perspective of what it means to be proud. And to love the process. Let's go to our final point. <clears throat> Let's go to 1 Timothy 4, 15. You guys still with me? 1 Timothy 4, 15 to 16. And it says this. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone will see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You know, Paul's writing this letter, this letter to Timothy, and what does he tell him? I want you to be diligent in these matters. As a matter of fact, give yourself wholly to them so that everyone will see your progress. Point number two, point number three is fight for progress. Fight for progress. Well, everyone loves the end story. But you gotta take it one step at a time. And you gotta learn to love progress. You gotta learn to love it. Because progress is reality. We live a life of constant progress. We live a life of constant transformation to get better and better. Paul's talking to Timothy and he tells him, man, I need you to be diligent in these matters. What does the word diligent mean here in the Greek? It means to attend carefully, to meditate, to devise, and the first definition of diligent is pain. Wow. He says, you're going to go, have a lot of pain in these matters. But he says you need to devise. Do you have a plan to progress? Do you have a plan to get better? Better at getting open. Better at sharing your faith. Better at having quiet times. A better prayer life. Do you want to get better as a disciple? You know, we had a campus retreat a few weeks ago in Kansas City, and it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. And we, we ended up playing checkers for one uh, for part of our free time. Honestly, the whole thing was free time. But we ended up playing checkers, and I was like killing it. I was like, man, this is awesome. I love checkers. I didn't even know I love checkers. <clears throat> I just lost to Jesse in eight seconds yesterday in chess. So <laughs> maybe I'll challenge him with checkers. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, you know, I loved it. We also had fishing. Rich was fishing, and I'm not even joking, he literally caught 12 fish. Wow. Not even in like three hours. We're like, man, are you paying this fish or something? <laughs> this guy a deal or what? Like, what's going on? I tried to fish for an hour, nothing. I even got a little superstitious, I'm like touching his pole. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Take the fishing out of it, you know? <laughs> nothing. I'm like, I'm not wasting my time fishing. I got better things to do, like play checkers. <laughs> <laughs> See, for all of us here, all of us love doing what we're good at. We yeah. love it. Yeah. We love it. So then why don't you get good at being a disciple? <laughs> Trust me, you'd love it. You know? If you get really good at sharing your faith, you would love it. You'd get really good at studying the Bible, you would just love it. Showing people the scriptures, you would love it. Discipleship would be so fun. So get better. You know, I'm always really good at his email, and you know, there it is consistently. You know, Anna's always fruitful. <laughs> consistently. I bet you she loves leading Bible studies. I bet you she loves sharing her faith. I bet you she loves it. Why? 
because she went back. You know, most people at the gym actually don't need to be there. They're just good at it. I need to be there. <laughs> and still good at it. You know? But that's why they're like, yeah, I'm already good at it. You know, I almost probably been working out five years. What did you do? Honestly, nothing. nothing. <laughs> There's a lot of people that I do work out that they don't. But most people do what they love. But life will be a but you have to learn that being a disciple will be a battle of progress your whole life. And you have to fall in love with that. I remember my first year of marriage. Me and Malia had a bump, and she was like crying. Like, you know. And I remember telling her, like, Malia, okay, this this pause and relax. <laughs> you know? It sounded like it was her, it was me. You know? <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Our marriage is horrible. Can I say that? Can I say that? You know? But it won't always be like this. But it is like that today. But if we just work on it, mainly if I just work on it, <laughs> it changes. If I just change, this is going to change. Now it's amazing. It's pretty. I love it. It's so awesome. This is so good. We work in this country. It's so awesome. But you got to fight for everything. I'm going to close it off with this quote. You know, in life, you can live a life of one day. One day I'll do this. One day I'll do that. One day this will happen. Or you can live a life of day one. Today is day one. Of your life. Of a life of victory. Day one. Reflect what you need to do and grow on it. So you can obviously live a life to the full in Christ. To God be glory.